Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. And thank you for coming. I'm Rosanna Hu, the chair of the architecture department here at the Wiseman School of Design. Before we start our program tonight, I want to acknowledge the land on which we gather. We don't have it up there, but I will read it. We acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania is situated upon the ancestral homeland and territory of the Leni Lenape peoples. As members of an educational community, we are obligated to know the histories of dispossession that have allowed the University of Pennsylvania to grow on this vibrant terrain. As designers and thinkers, we endeavor to build in ways that lead towards justice, and we are committed to working to dismantle the ongoing consequences of settler colonialism. Tonight, uh, we are welcoming a very special uh, member of this community, our very own Annette Fierro, for the introduction of her new book, Architectures of the Technopolis, Technopolis, um, Archigram and the British High Tech. Annette's talk will be followed by a discussion between Wiseman faculty, Verda Colaton, Daniela um, Fabricius, Vanessa Grossman and myself, and moderated by Fernando Lara. Uh, usually our lecture series are by uh, invited guests from different parts of the world, and so it's especially meaningful and I think very intimate. We can feel it right here when we celebrate as a community the accomplishments of our own family member. Um, so I think uh, we are just very happy that we have such a great turnout uh, from alumni, from students, from faculty here. Annette Fierro wears many hats at the Wiseman School of Design. She is an associate professor of architecture, director of admissions, so she has a lot of power uh, deciding who comes here. Thesis coordinator, also a lot of power deciding who leaves here um, with a diploma and Design Studio Coordinator of 502. She received a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Rice University and a Master of Architecture from Rice University also. Her early design work as a project architect has appeared in various architectural journals, including Assemblage, Architectural Record, Progressive Architecture, Lotus, and Texas Architect. Fierro also authored The Glass State, the Technology of the Spectacle, Paris 1981 to 1998, which focuses on issues of transparency and technologies of Francois Matron's grand projects in Paris. In the recently published book, the subject of our, um, of our talk tonight, she traces a network of legacies instigated by the radical technological speculation of the 1960s in London comparing the work of Archigram and the high-tech architects thematically. The book explores historical and cultural context of London to reveal their influences and interconnections, and why two such radical groups who share uncannily uh, similar impulses emerge from this seemingly conservative city. It's also packed with many other important histories and theories of that time, which will be discussed later in our roundtable. Now we want to welcome Annette. Thank you so much, Rosanna. Also, still welcome, Rosanna. It's so nice to have that kind of voice starting these events. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking a few others in this room. Uh, first, this book is dedicated to my children, Alejandro and Claudia. Are they here? There's one. There's one. <laughs> uh, they've been watching me write this book for much of their lives. Uh, and as every mother in this room knows, time taken away from your children is measured in solid gold. Books take time. So thank you for your support, your belief in me, and for just being who you are. Now second, my thanks to the dean, uh, actually several deans. I've outlived all of the deans. Um, 
who provided financial support for this book. Uh, since it's the current dean's birthday and he couldn't be here, I'll instead thank all of you in this room who make up the institution uh, that is only represented by the dean after all. So it was very nice of you to give me all of that money. <laughs> now third, I'd like to thank so many of my students, uh, especially those who took my seminar over the years called Archigram and its Legacy. Uh, this, this is, was a theory seminar, and the topic of this evening's discussion will not be simply about the book, but about how theory, how history intersects with design. Now, I always begin the seminar talking about how every time the seminar is offered, it is different, changing substantially uh, because of the input of the students. Uh, indeed, the content for this book emerged from discussions with them, uh, prompt, uh, prompted by research and pr presentations that I gave, uh, but they then took on turning and embellishing subject matter until it became fascinating to all of us. Uh, so as a real and true collaboration, the book represents in the best sense what can happen in a university, in a context which is explorative, which, is, which investigates, which follows threads here, there, and everywhere. So after I present, we'll be joined by faculty uh, to discuss both the book and this topic. You know, how these kinds of knowledges and how these kinds of practices work together to form a different kind of synthetic knowledge. Now, a second question follows uh, this book. Uh, I began my career as, as a designer, as an engineer even, and then migrated over to theory. So in this kind of, do, in this kind of multiplicity, what makes up research? Uh, a word which at Penn we throw around, around perhaps a bit too casually. This book came out of a great deal of reading of archival research, like any other kind of history book, uh, out of a great deal of talking to people, especially the kind members of Archigram, and you see Peter Cook in one of our seminars, actually. Uh, and all of these people I'm now lucky enough to regard as friends uh, after all of our conversations. It also came out of a great deal of direct architectural research, that is visiting offices and climbing around buildings that few people ever have access to. You see I'm here on top of a building looking down at London. Now the topic of this book emerged from a bit of audacity, uh, which to me was self-evident from the very beginning that Archigram, appearing in the 1960s, had been the formative inspiration uh, of the British high tech, who followed them by just a few years in many of the same institutions uh, and were suspended in a sphere of their immense influence. I have had to fight this case even to the very recent past where the new editor of my previous publisher, MIT Press, uh, is a now a new upstart uh, Brit, would not publish the book. And, but thankfully, a venerable British publisher, Lund Humphreys, did, and they did it magnificently. Uh, so buy the book. Now, as, as I said in my preface of that book, this affiliation of what became the international British high tech with the avant-garde of the 1960s has been so obvious for so long that it is either forgotten or inspires a great deal of denial. There is a self-evident commonality of language, overblown machines considered both as iconographic image and as technological pursuit, kits of parts of pieces and components, a disintegration of building as object in favor of the constituent elements, considered joint by joint, surface by surface, module by module. Underlying both movements is a mutual undying optimism in technological process and technological expression. Transferred from group to group and era to era, these traits and philosophies are so indelible that they form their own cohesive identity, joining the recent architecture of Great Britain to, to its history in the 1960s. This claim of lineage is both easy and difficult to make, as members of both groups are still living, and when asked, often vehemently deny the connection. Now certainly both groups were and are dramatically different. Archigram originated as a group of six young iconoclasts, uh, barely out of school, set out to challenge post-functionalist righteousness, gaining notoriety through a series of home-published pamphlets that could neither have been more modest nor more ambitious. In complete contrast, the architects known popularly as the high-tech 
emerged onto the popular stage through emphatic acts of building. Buildings of increasing scale, technological prowess, and prominence in international recognition. Nor could the cultural context of the two groups have been more different. For Archie Graham, the disaffection of the post-war 1950s fueled an exuberance that often courted the absurd, a provocation for the sake of provocation, easily dismissed until their farcical proposals were understood as profoundly prophetic. Could the effect of expanded definitions of technology for Archigram end in the dissipation of objects themselves? Archigram contended exactly this in the trajectory of their work. As megastructures dissolved over their career into ubiquitous bots, virtual effects, or at as extreme, simply ambiance. In contrast, the high tech's work prompted exactly the opposite conclusion. Coming into age in the late 1970s through the 1990s, they led the technological advancement in the building sciences internationally, bolstered by, economic explosion, by the economic explosion in the U UK of the 1990s. Heightened attention to systems of building construction led them to a dizzyingly prolific production of buildings throughout the world and a reification of buildings as concrete technological objects. Now, I'm not going to recount my argument in the book. For this, you have to read the book. Suffice it to say that it dips into historical and political utopias, into practices of engineering, what happens when one draws machines, the literal and metaphorical theatricality of technology, how literature has embraced infrastructure from walking through cities to moving around them underneath the ground. And finally, to the effect of war on the images that reappear as if in dreams in architects' imaginations. Instead, tonight I'm going to present a snippet of the book which was delivered for the opening of the M Plus Museum in Hong Kong a few years ago, uh, which had, after a good deal of controversy, acquired the archives of Archigram. Uh, I decided to present this, a proper academic paper, because it exemplifies how theory Words bring focus and clarity to architects' intentions. Now, the architects, Archigram, themselves have thanked me for this, delighted that someone made the self-evident now completely and emphatically public. Uh, but as architects, let me emphasize that words make your own intentions clear to yourself. And this is by far the most important thing I have to say to you tonight. Okay, so here, my piece is titled, Housing Subjectivities from the LCC to Uncle Wilf. Peter Cook once bemoaned to me that too much had been theorized about the French situationists, musing that perhaps it was the situationist's overt political stance that had fueled critical examination, something which Archigram in their inherent Britishness had shied away from. Certainly, any political stance is never mentioned explicitly in any of their original nine and a half self-published pamphlets, but, but there is much to suspect. This short essay, part of chapter one in my book, examines the early proposals of Archigram which had to do with housing, which had been the repository of the Utopian project, not simply in the United Kingdom, but in the European inheritance of CIAM modernism. In this context of late modernism, housing served as the morphological heart of the project to refigure the, quote, functionalist city. In the hierarchy of CIM's issues, principles of dwelling dominated over major organizing factors of the city, work, leisure, and circulation, all governed ostensibly by principles of science. The functionalist city of CIAM would be shaped primarily by the effect of the height of dwellings on available light and air, comprising the core of the ethics of the new life to be afforded to the city's inhabitants. Once rationalized, the patterning afforded by building distances could be expanded over vast landscapes, interrupted only by networks of rapid movement systems, becoming both the backbone of the new spatial structure of the city. The overriding sensibility in the planning of the units themselves was one of the minimalized dwelling rationalized by strictly functional considerations. Now, the, the critiques of modernist urbanism are familiar to students of architectural history. 
What is not especially familiar is the specific trajectory this ideology took in Great Britain, especially in post-war ravaged London. With the arrival of Alberto Lubetkin and Her Erno Goldfinger to London in the 1930s, expatriates from Russia and Hungary arriving from Paris, came the deep influence of Le, of Le Corbusier and mentor Auguste Perret in bringing modernist avant-garde to Great Britain. Perret's influence was directly registered in the high regard for the material of concrete, or beton brut, taken up later as the exclusive material of choice for British social housing, becoming a symbol even and to this day, and to this day still hated ferociously by many sectors of the British public. So too was the typology of the unité imported and used extensively in the UK, with its skip floor organization and its duplex maisonette unit, concentrated into a microcosmic monolithic city rising into the sky to liberate the ground below. Nowhere was this influence reflected as strongly as in the London County Council, a municipal group which had from the 1950s become the largest employer of architects in the country with a staff of over 1,700, including 350 professional architects and trainees, of whom 250 worked in housing. In 1963, three young architects employed by the LCC were Warren Chalk, Ron Heron, and Dennis Crompton, leaving that year to join Archigram. Coordinated through Abercrombie's famous plan for London of 1944, between 1945 and 1978, East, South, and Far West London were colonized by 918 differently scaled council housing projects. Now, much has been said about the failure of this housing, much of it debatable. Many of the lesser known council projects are still extant, successfully housing thousands of Londoners. This points to a certain amount of symbolism rather than fact. Many of the causes of the supposed failures are complex, entangled in issues which are socioeconomic but especially political. In Tom Cordell's Utopia London, a documentary film of 2010, he underscores that it was the council project's affiliations and symbolic associations with leftist politics which prodded successive conservative government, especially Margaret Thatcher's, to disinvest in them. This decimated adequate maintenance projects in the 1970s, prompting a more rapid descent from already troubled economies and, and histories. The final blow came with Thatcher's 1984 Right to Buy program, which, privately privati which partially privatized many of the housing projects, further debilitating the project's management. Uh, in most cases, council estates have partially been taken into competitive market structures, but the most massive estates have been demolished and then rebuilt under the supposedly benevolent term of, quote, regeneration. It is the most well-known of these council projects which present specific departures from the norm and are thus valuable in trying to decipher the undecipherable and the complexity of issues. My contention here in proposing this work in relation to Archigram, done largely at the same time in the, city, in the same city, is not one of cause and effect. But many of the positive and negative attributes exhibited and realized by the work, however, were pinpointed by Archigram with uncanny precision. Working rhetorically and hyperbolically, Archigram reacted to the modernist philosophical malaise with a voice uncompromised by the realities of practice. And it is the clarity of their voice which ends as a prescient echo in principles which currently flavor the most interesting of experiments in social housing. Now we begin in this pursuit first with the tower typologies of the LCC. Comparing the outcome of Erno Goldfinger's two towers, the Balfront Tower in East London of 1967 and their later Trellick Tower in Kensaltown, Notting Hill of 1972, we learn first that iconography and identifiability does indeed dras drastically influence fate, something that Archigram underscored later. Both housing marginal populations, their iconic presence, projecting onto the sky as vertical unites, prompted them eventually to be historically listed, which eventually saved them from being destroyed, though also in being cartoonishly vilified by popular media. Of the two, 
The Trellick Tower still functions as, a, as primarily social housing. Those unit, the units which come up for sale are highly coveted and expensive. The ball front is a more recent arrival to development. Its present iconicity has been said now, ironically, to stand for the, quote, social cleansing of the old working class Poplar District too close to Canary Wharf to remain. J.G. Ballard predicted that when the bourgeois moved into the towers, they would end up eating each other, or at least each other's dogs. Danny Boyle used the Balfron Tower as the stage for blood-infected zombies. Now, the fate of the nearby Keeling Tower by Dennis Lasden of 1957 is similar. Distinguished as three finely detailed concrete towers slightly oriented toward each other, Lasden speculated that the angular dispossession it would engender, that the angular disposition would engender acquaintance between residents uh, to form sub-communities. In George Finch's two projects in Lambeth, the Cotton Garden Estate and the Peckham Tower, both of 1968, prefabricated concrete construction would allow for eccentric stacking of units, allowing, as he expressed, the buildings to, quote, dance around providing the difference of vantage and view from within and without, breaking the monolithic reading of the ensemble. Finch illustrated his ideas with cartoons, showing the working classes enjoying their new life of simple pleasures up in the sky, rather than portraying any kind of edified noblesse. From Keeling and Finch, then, we continue to see the significance of iconic presence, but one that has cleverly altered the modernist canon providing a twist of geometry here or there, or an eccentric protrusion of a unit, amounted to an acknowledgement that there are individual people living within, with relationships to each other. Finch's projects also hint at the power of humor to deconstruct the canon, to humanize occupancy. Both of these revolutionary concepts mirrored Archigram's work, which had preceded it. Notably, both Finch towers still function as social housing. Now, going down in scale to a more familiar terrace height and organization, we find one spectacular acknowledgement of the same power of individuation in Neve Brown's famous Alexandra Road estate in Camden of 1978, a highly successful project that works in all ways. Maintaining its ethnically mixed social housing constituency, Brown's project is inserted carefully into the existing context stepping the units back and up, incrementally enclosing a central public walk, Brown provides patios which allow each resident a personalized garden. Most importantly, this allows them free expression without legislation of aesthetic misdemeanors. Every plant, piece of hanging laundry, or unwanted unsightly equipment attest happily to the inhabitant just inside. Here the power which Archigram had previously crystallized in their proposals, of affording choice, of allowing people to express where they live and how they choose to interact with their own identity and have pleasure in doing so. At the other end of the scale, we find in many ways the largest contrast as well as the greatest and most authentic failures of which I will only cite three the monstrous slab districts of the LCC, which came closest to realizing the Ville Radieuse in London, both Hans-Peter Trenton's Aylesbury Estate of 1963 and Tim Timker's nearby Haygate Estate of 1974 in southeast London were based on housing the largest possible number of people on available land. At Aylesbury, 7,500 people, at Haygate, 3,000. These two became popularized in films as utter dystopias, symbols for the oppressive subjugation of massive numbers of people to institutionalized forms of living. Haygate was demolished in 2014. Its tenants were forcibly evicted, often given less than 40% of market value for their units. To date, 100% of units have been sold to foreign investors. Aylesbury, sometimes called the symbol of the failure of social housing in Britain, is currently being demolished and rebuilt similarly in phases to 2027. Most tragic was Peter and Alison Smithson's massive Robin Hood estate of 1972. Significant architecturally for many reasons, but here undebatably a disaster from the start. After only three days of living in the project, residents began to viciously and violently destroy the buildings themselves. 
Allison Smithson, in tone-deaf exasperation, blamed the jealousy, greed, and avarice of the residents. After much heart-wrenching debate and protest, but with 75% of residents agreeing when petitioned, Robin Hood Estate II was demolished in 2021 to be rebuilt as a similarly anonymous regeneration project. The hatred directed toward Haygate, Aylesbury, and Robin Hood give ammunition to efforts to erase the utopian project of modern urbanism in London along with its politics, which seem at least as much of an issue as the attributes of its architecture. Nevertheless, there is an obvious conclusion that architects must bear witness to. Concentrating and isolating huge numbers of marginalized people without choice in essentialist, universalized typologies is a mistake of stupendous proportions. These people, often of diverse ethnic and demographic origins, were not only forced to live in these concrete monuments, but also forced to relinquish their identities to them. Neither can the government's regeneration program be touted as any kind of real solution to rehousing Britain's poor. Since Thatcher's scheme was introduced in 1980, more than two million council homes have been lost across the UK. The sites of some of the worst riots in the past 20 years have coincided with proximities to large-scale demolition of housing, mixing specifically motivated racial events with the disenfranch disenfranchisement and displacement of thousands of largely black and ethnic minority residents. Undoubtedly, Archie Graham realized these same conclusions of the dilemmas plaguing modernist housing. Writing on Plug-in City in 1964, Peter Cook says, quote, but overriding all this was the deliberate variateness, variateness this is a made-up word, of each major bu building outcrop. Whatever else it was to be, this city was not going to be a deadly piece of built mathematics. As early as 1962, Archie Graham included a statement uh, from a group within the LCC of Chalk, Heron, and Crompton, along with Roberts, Attenborough, and Curry, emphasizing that liberating the discipline from, quote, preconceived formalities and art ideologies would be informed by, quote, a deep responsibility for human needs. This would be accomplished by, quote, twisting the straight line of architecture. Now, this was illustrated in the publication of their projects with the LCC for the Westminster Housing of 1961, the Hale Zones Housing of 1962, and the Lillington Street Housing of 1960 in Vauxhall, using concepts of an adaptable spine responding to changing topography and allowing a variety of unit types to essentially plug into it. In a series of interviews in, in Archigram 2, Tim Tinker, the architect of the Haygate Estate, writes a manifesto of 10 questions in search of an answer. Quote, how can high density develop so that people's justified desires for self-expression and enjoyment add to the kaleidoscope of the community instead of being the odd pieces that upset the pre-planned pattern? Tinker calls for manipulating mass production and standardization to rise to the aspirations of the people. In the second half of Archigram 2, the creative forces of Archigram members are unleashed. David Green and Peter Cook published their winning entry of the Gas Council housing competition based on minimal dwellings creatively grouped for social interaction. Elsewhere in the pamphlet, material experimentation emerges. David Green produces his spray plastic house, releasing an unnerving primitivism for contemporary dwelling. Peter Cook in metal cabin housing expands the complexity of the spine, forming a double and triple hierarchy of organizing elements, spines, and subspines, holding car body type units on precast guts, setting the stage then for Plug in City. In the next few Archigram issues, the group's attention to housing fades while other major themes percolate, all of which are pertinent if not directly. Archigram 3 brings expendability and off-the-shelf consumerism, much of which is lifted from residential supplier catalogs. In this issue, the ICA Living City exhibit of 1963 is also published, which simulates immersivity as the mode through which the vitality of the city operates. The text for the exhibit cites Jane Jacobs and advocates for the immensity of trivialities which make up the complexity of the city. Peter Cook's Come Go project of 1963 stresses relationality, 
multiple dimensions of connectivity in the components of the city, which manifest themselves as temporalities. Dennis Crompton's synthesizer project equates organicity with computer mechanisms, all marvelous, marvelously prophetic with computer mechanisms. Oh no, I'm, I'm sorry, all marvelously prophetic to an age of the smart city. In the space of two years, Archigram's thinking has exploded far beyond a critique of modernism, expanding spatial vocabulary of the city into visionary dimensions wrought by technology and world events. Archigram 4, Zoom, brings science fiction to the domain of the dwelling, using new technologies to challenge a psychological and physiological domestic interiority, reaching an apotheosis. Ap Apotheosis in David Green's Living Pods. Warren Chuck re refigures the componentry of the mass produced dwelling in the first capsule, a tight fit of pieces and parts envisioned flying through the air via cranes, recombining and settling into a vertical infrastructure, if only for a temporary moment. This, again, the essence of Plug in City, a diverse community of deployed gadgetry endlessly recombining pieces and parts of the city at all scales down to the most intimate of the dwelling space. In Archigram 5, the obsessive quest for new forms of the vital city reiterates housing as the city's primordial element, collaging Parisian housing by Henri Sauvage, adjacent to the dreams of Arata Isosaki, Yona Friedman, and many others. The crust of the city, the enabler of its dynamic presence, the matter that makes densities of interaction possible is always housing. It is the material figure, the substrate of form, waiting to be enervated by movement systems, either dissipated in plug-in city or concentrated and put on legs in walking city. It is not until the end of this issue in auto-environment that Michael Webb returns to the more in intimate implications of kinetic machinery and domestic space. Ambiguous vehicles figure and reconfigure houses like phases of origami. These vehicles are cyborgs, half machine, half inhabitant, half vehicle, uh, half body, where body becomes dwelling, becomes machine, all dancing acrobatically in space, reconfiguring effortlessly in, in response to temporal dance and environmental designs, a dance, an animation. And I should say that the top drawing was redone by Michael Webb specifically for my book, which I'm very happy about. The ideas are re-explored in Webb's uh, later Cushicle, where ultimate dwelling is one's body, where skin becomes machinic interface, a deployable surface capable of transfiguration through material phase change or multiple interactions with other fellow cyborgs. These ideas are re-explored in Webb's later Cushicle and Pseudaloon, where ultimate dwelling is one's body, where skin becomes machinic interface, a deployable surface capable of transfiguration through material phase change and, and or multiple interactions. These ideas come together in Archie Graham's control and choice dwelling of 1966-67. Now explicitly a multi-family dwelling, a multitude of systems are overlaid upon each other to define space, degrees of enclosure and interaction, and a horde of other different activities of dwelling. Most important in this description is the word degree, as the systems are described as on a, quote, sliding scale, inferring an infinite number of graduated interactions. The first level of hierarchy is that of the pylon structure and the route for electrical vehicles, which divides the families from each other. The vertical pylon structure can itself be hybridized by lateral, horizontal, or diagonal structures. Next come floor, wall, truss, substructural kits, allowing for any element to be activated by air, electricity, information, or even sound. But these are not mute technical systems, they are personified. They themselves are caricaturized inhabitants of the systems of the systems itself. Next, the roboticized elements, which Peter, Peter Cook notes are less humanoid than at the 1990 house. We presume the personification was too static in the earlier project, and it has spread to infect all aspects of the structure and the inhabitants themselves in a sliding definition of cyborg makeup. In Cook's text describing the project, the final element in the hierarchy is the satellite, describing less elements than properties of metamorphosis. 
hard things which can become soft, vehicles which can become rooms, the served becoming the servants, all in fluid states of definition and hierarchy. Still emphatic, however, are the inhabitants themselves, and their importance cannot be understated for my argument. They are named. They are individualized. They are eccentric. They cannot be presumed to have any standard attribute. They cannot be stereotyped. They cannot be universalized. There they are, George and Doris, possessed by their vehicles, Uncle Wilf, the family fatso near the food, and Rita, the occasional introvert. This is a concept for dwelling set up to attain higher and higher orders of complexity, a nonlinear versus linear idea of mathematics, where neither the form of the dwelling or its units are ever fixed or finite, where hierarchies are mixed and interchanged. This is a breathing organic machine of play and response, of a porous, flexible interface, constantly redefining and being redefined. As a rhetorical statement, it is a utopia, there, this is a vision for a totally subjectivized form of housing. Buried in archigrams, absurdist graphics are political provocations with a deeply ethical critique and mission, an affront to the universalism of, 19, of 1934, which had done so much damage to the city. In the late 1950s, Henri Lefebvre wrote on the multiplicity and interactive connectivities between different analytical structures of the city, an idea that enraptured especially the French situationists, with whom he collaborated with for several years. Lefebvre had noted that the essential need for creative activity, for all things to do with the imaginary and the creative play of its citizens. The oeuvre of the city, the writing of the city, were the everyday acts of its inhabitants. This was not a polite call for correctness. This was a demand for revolution. Embedded is the concept of play as an intrinsic element of human culture, which had been fermenting since the publication of Homo Ludens, in 1938, which we know from Rainer Banham was deeply influential to the architectural cut culture of the 1960s UK. We know these ideas were very much present in Europe at the same moment, but much more elusive, less theorized, certainly less open to being grasped and described are the speculations of Archigram, whose entire oeuvre intuitively embodied the same capacity of play for self-empowerment. Their projects of housing comprise a critique of universalist presumptions of the CIM-inspired socialist housing on the left, but also a Prussian critique of pure market strategies on the right, which devoid of any kind of aspiration are equally universal and far less accessible. And in their unremitting exploration for a different paradigm of housing, structurally composed of choice, Archigram's critique also deploys the withering power of popular humor far less elitist than the situationist Dadaist absurdities. Now the concepts present in, the, the concepts present in both Archigram and Cedric Price's oeuvre, oeuvre can be provocatively transferred to the present tense in similar terminologies that have evolved within computational culture. In their seminal guidebook, Rules of, Rules of Play, Salen and Zimmerman contrive an ultimate game based on cellular automata where interactions between cells are doubled and tripled according to the interactions of the cells adjacent to them, spiraling mathematically into rich visual patterns or emergences. They call this game life, noting that at its basis are observations of bottom-up behavior, namely that given the right rules and enough interactions, out of a tangle of complexity something magical happens. Systems self-organize and cities are born. Archigram again proves prescient to revolutionary concepts which we have eventually turned to. Now has society grown up enough to deploy some of the precise observations that Archigram's control and choice imagined? No. Not either in general architectural examples or specifically in housing, especially at the scale necessary for true emergence to occur, neither through operations of kinetic machines nor really as any kind of palp palpable architectural object. Control and choice was itself, however, a metaphor. As archigram evolved over its short history, 
Physical tangibilities in their projects continuously evaporated into forms of cultural and technological inter interaction, but most importantly in the space of radically shifting paradigms. This is where these powerful ideas continue to reside. You see, I have a critic. Looking askance from their architectural manifestations, these proposals for endless variation emerging from actions and interactions of common denominators can be located in the, in the most unlikely of places. And this my contention to end this speculation, though it remains entirely outside the scope of my argument. In the mission statements of the most creatively evolving communities of housing, we see the literal words of Archigram. Their proclamations for change, choice, and variety now becoming so common and so pervasive that they are in danger of, if anything, of becoming platitudes. Born out of a tenacious resistance to pure market structures in these models, we see constituents directing local control and purchase of land, self-organizing grassroots development of commerce, building, and public realm. Now, this particular example that I show, the Coin Street Community Builders, is located exactly adjacent to the LCC South Bank Center of 1967 on the South Bank. The project that Chalk, Crompton, and Heron worked on before departing for Archigram, and which Dennis Crompton had spoken of many times about, praising the emergence of activity and identity through the complexity of dynamic life cycles. Serendipity is unlikely. Thank you. I suppose the faculty can join us. Yes. And should I sit this out while you talk? Or I should stay here. <laughs> OK. So thank you so much, Annette, for the honor of inviting us to discuss your book, for inviting me to moderate. Uh, when Annette invited me to be here in this event and we were brainstorming about what's going to happen tonight, she really wanted a conversation between history theory and design. And we came up with this format here with two professors of history theory and two professors of design in order to create a kind of a brainstorming or a, a discussion on Annette's book. As a moderator, I will be very quiet. I will basically control time and, 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 uh, and, and organize the questions. But I have the uh, privilege to set up a little bit of a framework for the conversation. Uh, I see Annette's book as a, may, mainly a love letter to the relationship between history theory and design. Uh, you borrowed a lot of things from history theory, a lot of mannerisms. Uh, you have in your book a very well-defined time period uh, from the early 60s to the early 2010s, those 50 years there between the beginning of Archigram and the London Olympics, uh, you have a well-defined geography. Your book is about the city of London. Yes. And when you leave the city of London and have to talk about the Pompidou Center in Paris, it's only to claim that the Pompidou is the first building of the British high tech. Uh, a statement that will make both the British and the French very mad at you. Uh, because they, it's very problematic. Uh, but, and, and, and you also presented your book on the history theory format, reading a paper for us. So there are many, uh, many layers there, many instances, your archival research, your use of those methods. There are many layers there that you borrowed or paid a homage to history theory. But in the end, your book is a major celebration of the power of design, the power of 
using those abstractions, proxies that we call drawings to transform the future. That's your main thesis, that the Archidrum paper work became the British high tech of 30, 40 years later. So with that frame uh, on the table, I will open the microphone to my colleagues and see what they want to say. I can start. Please. Well, as I hate to improvise, and I had many, many thoughts when I read your book, I decided to write them down and I'll read, and I will be fast. But first of all, I would like to thank you, Annette, because this is a great honor for me to be here and celebrate the launch of your book in this joyful event. It is joyful because um, it's about you and about Archigram. Uh, but also about the many architects who have worked for, let's say, serious people, not to say bad people or corporations, but who have dedicated their work to humor, to idiosyncrasy, and who have been driven by the desire to create a playful sense of theatricality, social experience, and even fantasy in a city that is so important for culture and technology, and for the fusion of the two, and for architectural culture at large. And that city is, of course, London. And it was really a pleasure to read your book, which took me on a journey across the channel. And I say that because like you, uh, I lived and worked in and on France for many years, but you took me to buildings, uh, sites and infrastructures that I knew, and yet you made me see them in a different way and through a whole set of connections and networks. You also took me to sites, neighborhoods, parks and buildings, uh, and to many archives and instances of collective psychology and collective memory such as those related to war trauma that I did not know and that you analyzed so thoroughly. So it has been a transcolor, transmedia, and transtemporal journey. And you built non-linearly, which is great, on both local and global histories of architecture since the British Empire and the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And these are, of course, completely interrelated, uh, which is why London is so important for understanding the spatial experience of capitalism, including the technologies, infrastructures, labor dynamics, and other forms of exploitation that were necessary for its development. It is no coincidence that London was Marx's home, and for, from 19, 1849, when he was the age of 31, until his death in 1883, Karl Marx lived in London. And I have to say that I missed Karl Marx in this story, reporting from London on how, and I quote, Machinery is adapted to the weakness of man in order to turn the weak man into a machine. And as I read your book, I also kept thinking about a possible lens for this story based on contemporary debates about post-humanism. But I think I know why you did not engage with that concept. You call London Technopolis, and the book, I quote, I quote from it, the story of a major culture in a state of upheaval. And I would like to ask you to tell us more about this concept of Technopolis if we can, so we have time tonight. So informed by our ongoing frequent conversations and my recent participation in your studio, studio Crete, I uh, have to join Fernando here, and I also read your book as a genuine drive by a scholar and as an educator to bridge the divide between history and theory and the practice of architecture. I also read it as an argument for how architecture can embody different media, both material and virtual, both importantly constitutive of the realm of culture and knowledge, and how architecture, even in its most highly technological forms, can inhabit different notions of time and be at once futuristic and nostalgic and traditional. And to open the conversation with my peers in this table, what I really like about this book is that you do a series of very thorough analysis of buildings and architectural drawings, and by drawings, I also include print ephemera or just ephemera in the realm of space and architecture, and that they are given equal status in your book. They are as culturally significant as they are spatially significant because the way that drawings and images, to take a cue from Guy Debord, circulate in our field of architecture, which is both visual and spatial, they end up triggering the production of other designs that are also what you call technological dreams or even utopias. And beyond archigrams and high-tech architects' intersection with the concept of utopia, as you write, the realm of the utopian in architecture, of utopian visions and ambitions, reads in your book as an idée fixe of yours. 
Uh, we know that utopian visions and aspirations can also produce dystopias, or what a Frenchman, not a Brighton, Michel Foucault called heterotopia. For Foucault, while utopias are sites without a real place, presenting society as a perfected form, there are also real places that are act as counter sites enacting utopia in real life, places like cemeteries, the heterotopias. You do not develop these last two concepts very much in your book, but maybe we can talk about them. But I would simply ask you to address the concept of utopia itself and how you think it can connect designing theory, especially as someone who has dedicated her career to teaching both. You take us through the genesis of this concept, utopia, which not coincidentally was formalized in Greek by a Brighton, Thomas More, but you do not shy away from a disclaimer by an American, the literary critic Frederick Jameson, whom you quote poignantly. And I quote here, utopias tend to remain solidly within the ideolo ideologies in which they are conceived. And this, of course, applies to the two polar protagonists of your story. And so you relate the two Brits, Archie Graham and the avant-garde of the 60s, to the high-tech architects of the late 70s and to the 90s, even though they seem to operate, as you say, at seemingly irreconcilable, uh, irreconcilable, irreconcilable poles. But you show that there is so much more in common in the realm of counterculture and mainstream, and that one feeds the other, a proximity that you call uncanny. So your book seeks to identify this intertwining in the way they relate to major themes other than sharing the same national or urban borders. The legacy of engineers, of structural and human-machine relationships, and of mechanization taking command, in the way they explore the realm of memory, performance, cybernetics, and infrastructural thinking, in their obsession with science fiction and wartime devices and mobility, in the way they update modernism, and search for authentic forms and experiences of urban life. They employ similar strategies, overblown machines as, bo as both iconographic image and technological claim, kits of parts and components, the deconstruction of buildings, and above all, what you call an undying optimism in technological process and technological expression. So your book reminds us of the agency of images and their narratives and of the power of the mastery of draftsmanship which has taken on a different status since the digital turn. So you conclude the book with an interview you conducted with David Green, an original member of Archigram, and Theodorus Peterpoulos, director of the Design Research Laboratories at the Architectural Association. And at one point, they are discussing the meaning of the word experimental in architecture. And David Green says, and I quote, the only reason I don't like the word is that Archigram was always called experimental architecture, and it wasn't. It wasn't experimental. You could have built it the next day if you had the money or the inclination. So where was the experiment? End of quote. So the epilogue of the book leaves us with this question. Would there have been no Archigram, only high tech, if the opportunity had presented itself in the 60s? I'm reminded of a New York Times headline from 1972, counterculture or over-the-counter culture. Today, we live in an immaterial version of Archigram's plug-in city, as if we were virtually inhabiting Michael Webb's cushicles and sutalons, with our socially entirely mediated by, our sociability is entirely mediated by mobile devices and media. And as you wrote, hardly fantasies, Archigram sensor bots have become iPhones and drones. Their computer cities have become smart cities. They feel much more real and ubiquitous than high-tech buildings. So thank you so much for this book. I hope you realize I can't possibly answer that. <laughs> and on top of that, we don't want this to be like a PhD dissertation defense yeah. that you answer <laughs> what we have to say. To so yes, so let me pass the microphone to my or the three colleagues who wants to go next. I just want to say that after that, I think we can go home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everything's been said already. Five minutes. I, should I jump in? Sure. I was just about to say, <clears throat> it's interesting to see where the design and history theory divide appears to be just also based on like the preparation and the rigorousness of presentation. And that was quite something, two, two lectures for one. Um, I came kind of unprepared 
in the sense that um, I did look at the book. I didn't read it entirely. I looked at it. I listened to the presentation uh, before. Um, I mean, it's really a wonderful book, great accomplishment, and I, I want to congratulate you. Um, I don't know. I I have a maybe the way I want to enter this is 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 from a slightly different angle. Um, looking at at the work presented uh, today, and and that's also what the audience has seen mostly. Um, the work presented in the slides today. I mean, it was just interesting to me how you began the lecture by also differentiating between the technological image and the technological object. And um, if I understand you correctly, there was, um, you know, one was referring more to the work, the technological image, referring uh, more to the work of Archigram and the technological object to high-tech architecture. And I think in your example, it was the Centre Pompidou. And I don't know, when I was hearing that, it's some, something, you know, clicked in my head and it also reminded me to some of the discussions we've been having between uh, theory and design um, lately, uh, the notion of uh, the image in particular, right, the production of images um, and what their value is in the context of today. Um, it seemed that was an unquestionable um, or, or, you know, it was a, a quality of architecture that was unquestioned in the 60s and 70s. Um, that there was an avenue to um, produce design that was unapologetic in the way how it um, worked through images. And that the architect provided a certain kind of image which was different than, let's say, the image provided um, by a painter or writer or stage actor and, and so forth. And there was something very particular, and I think... Um, the images provided by Archigram um, in the way how they talk about uh, the, the issues of their day, be they technological, but also about consumer um, society, you know, plug-in city. Obviously, a lot of these ideas were driven by, um, you know, the trivial, as you mentioned, the things that we can seemingly put together and reorganize um, as designers in ways um, that are in principle, very different than how orthodox modern architects used to think, which was not at all trivial, but it was ideologically heavy and therefore universal and so forth. Um, and I don't know, I was, I was sort of jumping back in my own mind and thinking, um, you know, where are we today in regard to the architectural image um, or slash the technological image? The 90s have been in between, right? They came in, they came in full force with the notion of the digital. Um, and we suddenly had a lot of ideologies that were revolving around conditions of um, biology and weather patterns and chaos theory. Um, you mentioned also um, nonlinear uh, ideas versus linear ideas. Right? Emergence is another notion you picked that in the 90s was very, very big and you tie it back to um, the 60s and Archigram's work as something that, like nature, can kind of emerge from a set of principles that we control, perhaps not too much, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know, I'm rambling a little bit, as you can see, but I think that's also <laughs> how I personally think through design problems um, often. And I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, rereading um, the work of Archigram, particularly in regard to the relationship of the technological image and the technological object, both in architecture, both representing architecture, and what the difference is between those. Um, it seems there's an obvious answer, right? I mean, one has to become concrete and therefore perhaps lose some of the qualities that the more speculative has. But I think there's something else that, that goes on there. And in the 60s, since it's the beginning of sort of the ecological movement and really the beginning of, you know, space travel and all of that, there's a certain naivete that we no longer have. Um, and I, again, it's just an open question also for my colleagues, but I wonder where that question of the technology, the technological architectural image and object, where we navigate and how we navigate that, perhaps also how we teach it. It's something that I took away from your presentation. Um, it, it's really funny that we're, we're the two 
representations of, of design and uh, what you just expressed are exactly what was going on in my head when I was listening to the presentation. And um, I, I wrote here a quote that I noticed on, I think, one of the, one of the posters. Um, there is a gap between idea and image. And that quote just kind of lingered. And because, you know, since I've been here, the, today kind of marks the, the, the start of the third month that I've been here, and, and I've spoken to many faculties, uh, design faculties, technology faculties, and history and theory, uh, as if they are uh, separate divisions. Uh, and of course, we, we have to have these kind of categories, but uh, in my mind, I actually never really uh, see them as separate entities. Um, I see that, you know, design is always at the center of these two things that are very much integrated. And I think today, what I really appreciate is, um, and earlier on we talked about the integration of, of design and history theory, but it's actually uh, very much technology is at the center of this conversation. Um, but then how is technology represented? Again, is you know the, the question I have in my mind. And I wonder, Annette, you teach design. And like you said, you started as a designer and then you kind of came to uh, history and theory, um, but you continue to teach design. So where do you see, and it's kind of like following Ferda's question, right? Where do you see kind of this, um, it's almost like a radical pedagogy, right? Um, how we are now moving towards a new, tech, a new uh, kind of the fourth, uh, Technol uh, technological uh, revolution, and we're all searching. I think it's not just in the school, but definitely very, uh, very much uh, at the at the center of our exploration in the school. Is how is that expression going to change? And many different schools all over the world is is looking for that new expression, and we all have different takes on that new expression, and we've all, you know. We're all critiquing each other on whether or not we have found or we're on the way to finding that new expression. But in working on this book, I'm sure that's also in your mind, and you probably found some insight that you want to share as a designer, as an educator, um, to share with us on, on what you have found. <laughs> Um, you, you know, there's still so much that's open in the work. Um, when I migrated from the study of the, the Mitterrand glass buildings uh, to London, it was with a kind of epiphany that, oh my God, the Centre Pompidou was really a British building, right? And diving into what made that a British building led to this exhaustion of archigram and uh, the, the kind of interest that they brought to the table, which were really um, their own. Um, what, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I start thinking about what, what are we interested in now? And, and certainly this, this kind of question of the kind of mechanical, the kinetic, you know, that's, 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 I regard that as entirely as metaphorical, uh, especially for Archigram. And by the end of their first phase of, uh, of design, they had already left that, where they were looking at uh, systems that, were, that would vaporize. Uh, and we're, we're talking about information, and we're talking about cybernetics, and we're talking about all kinds of things which ended up developing in different ways. Um, the end of, uh, of Archigram, they published uh, Archigram 9, uh, which was, was, was a um, pamphlet on environment. Uh, and it, was, it, it came stapled with a seed packet on the front so that you were to interact with it by taking the seeds out and planting them. Right? And then inside the pamphlet, there was all kinds of poems about lawns. Uh, and David Green had an obsession with lawns. Uh, and many of the things they were designing them were little machines that looked like rodents or insects 
that would wander around in the grass, uh, either interacting with the environment or uh, giving information to the people that were picnicking above them. Um, Peter Cook also went on to do, you know, a magnificent series of drawings which had to do with hybridized landscape architectures where uh, architecture was cannibalized by plant material. Uh, both at a domestic scale, he talks about these uh, with a kind of nostalgia for lost gardens, like lost British gardens, uh, but then for very serious proposals which have a lot akin to do with how infrastructures and landscape actually work now at much larger scales. So I think, I mean, this is obviously what I'm exploring next. <laughs> but I think uh, there is the, the, the respect that I take from them is the kind of volume of idea work that still remain uh, open, uh, open to thinking about and open to exploring. Uh, which I, I had not been aware of at all right, before I started this work. Uh, so what does this give us? Um, certainly, you know, I think uh, Archigram understood technological objects and they understood the spectacle in the way that Guy Debord understood the spectacle. Uh, they, they, they embraced it, right? They did. Uh, and so you were completely right on with that. But they embraced it as, as a confrontation of the permanence which they assigned to the establishment society. And so their investigation of temporality and of consumerism and expendability uh, was entirely naive of the kind of uh, dilemmas that that would propose. But what they wanted to undermine is the status of the permanent uh, and the monumental, uh, and the kind of undermining of just about everything within that. Uh, you know, when you think about the high tech in all of this, and, and it's very funny, I interviewed all kinds of people at the AA then, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you would say the word Renzo Piano, and they would say, oh, he was a good student, but boy, was he dumb. <laughs> Yes, they said this. Um, and what they meant was that he was just a producer. He was a producer that didn't really have ideas. Um, and there are many people that they talked about this way, but they never talked about David Green or Peter Cook or anyone like this because there was respect for that. Um, and I think the kind of conceptualism of that followed along with many ideas that were going on in the fine arts. Uh, and so when it was given to the high-tech architects, there's none of that, right? In fact, you ask them what their buildings are about, and it's all about the technological pursuit. Now, of course, that's given us some of the most um, beautiful manifestations of systems, of buildings, of modules, uh, of material usage, uh, and they've sort of led the world in these kinds of speculations. Uh, as well for the engineers that are all accompany them. I mean, when you think about British engineers, who can hold a candle to British engineering? They gave us Arab, they gave us all kinds of different people that have revolutionized the way that we think about building. But do they have the same kind of conceptual speculation that Archigram did? No, because the pursuit is a linear one which is about technology. Right? You draw it this way, it manifests itself this way, you probe the, uh, the scale, the scope, the way of building, uh, and the object is supposedly linearly constructed or sort of constructs itself out of these kinds of explorations of technology. But it's without the kind of ideation uh, that I find so provocative uh, in the work of Archigram. This is what sort of drives me, and I'm sure all the students that I have in studio are smiling about this because I'm sure you saw a lot of the ideas that I presented today, uh, certainly with the personified uh, emblems, uh, certainly this idea now with a kind of hybridized landscape architecture uh, that uh, continue to fascinate me both in the design studio where sometimes you theorize because I think that's a kind of, as a design practice we can't theorize constantly, right, because it stops a creative process. I, I, as a teacher, I've always thought you theorize, you know, 
every five or six weeks, you theorize, <laughs> to make sure that you still have ideas going in your projects. But if you theorize daily, it's a t it totally stalls the process. That means because only twice during the semester. Yes. <laughs> three times, three times. <laughs> Um, so it's a, it's a kind of wonderful reciprocity about how the left and the right brain works, right? You know, the, uh, and, I, and as, as I said at the beginning, I think that um, writing about your work clarifies it in a different way than drawing your work. Uh, and I think that it's absolutely essential to have both capacities working simultaneously. That's my two cents. And that... Um Thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, I really, I learned so much from your book. Um, I have to say that my reading of Archogram until now was pretty much framed by uh, Simon Sadler's work. Um, and the link, well, well, I don't know. I still, I, there's, there are things about it that I also appreciate very much. Um, but the link to high tech was, it was really fun to think through that. Um, especially because it, it, I don't know why it never occurred to me that there would be this connection and also um, how complicated that connection might be and how much it says about, um, I think um, Fernando said it, uh, about this sort of uh, connection between utopian speculative projects and big expensive things that are built in the world. Um, and one thing I, I keep, well, I always, you know, I look at this uh, work and I keep kind of moving towards the present and, you know, what, what's happened and what, what, how has this evolved? And we know that there are certain naivetes, as you mentioned, in Archogram's work. Um, and I really appreciate, by the way, the contextualizing of the post-war period, uh, or actually the trauma of the war and the bombing, if we... Maybe if there's time, we can talk about that. Um, but I, I kept getting sort of caught up on this, on those, or a little like kind of obsessed with the terms choice and control. I thought those were very interesting. And I hadn't seen that drawing before where they say, and in French, too, choix control, choice control. Um, and um, I started to wonder what, um, how important it was for these component parts to be manifested and to be physical, um, to be visible, uh, kinetic. Um, um, why, you know, how that's related to this idea of, um, and this is very Simon Sadlery, but um, <laughs> when they say that, sorry, it's so dark, I can't see anything. A family is, a family is made up of individuals. Of course, that sounds like Margaret Thatcher saying society is made of individuals, et cetera. Um, but uh, the, you know, why was choice so important to them um, or why was so much emphasis placed on choice as a critique of kind of social housing um, when there are many other things that also have caused some of that housing to fail? Um, and the, uh, the example of, the, sorry, not, not that familiar with the British context, but the Alexandra and Ainsworth estate where um, I feel like a lot of the choice is related to actually nature, like the vegetation and the sort of self-expression pointed out, um, stood out for me. Um, so what, yeah, so why the sort of emphasis on choice um, and what your thoughts are on this idea of control, especially with what I would describe as the kind of, from in the 68 to 85 diagram, the sort of miniaturization or uh, vaporization, as you describe, of these big mechanical bits into smaller and smaller and more organic kinds of bits, and eventually into the landscape, those beautiful drawings, those late drawings showing kind of sentient landscapes. Um, so I wonder if you have thoughts on this question of control, you know, thinking of it in terms of Deleuze's famous con society, Control Society essay of 1992. Um, you know, where do you think we sort of landed with that? Um, well, I guess the first question was why were they so obsessed with the idea of choice first? Um, and where we sort of landed with 
control and choice, especially um, considering this process of dematerialization or miniaturization of these technologies? Um, I think, at least the way I framed it, I think the question of choice is pointing directly at the 1950s, right? It's not anticipating um, uh, anything that looks at the way that Deleuze is talking about, about the same ideas. Um, and uh, I think, you know, Archigram, they were ciphers in many ways. Um, and what's interesting is that when you ask them like to describe the philosophies of their work, they resist it very strongly, right? Uh, it's only the pamphlets uh, that, be, that provided such a resource for me uh, because there's so much writing in the pamphlets. And it's not just their writing, but the, the writings of others that they choose to highlight. Uh, and then it's also the writings that are incorporated into the drawings themselves. And that's a kind of rich minefield of things to look at and think about. Because what they say they were doing, they very often weren't doing. Mm -hmm. No, I know, I know that you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, they talk about how they were resisting anything coming from the continent, but in fact, you know, they were there when Constant presented New Babylon. They were sitting in the audience, uh, and they say that they they weren't listening to the ideas; they were just lo looking at the images. But in fact, exactly at the same moment, they start talking about the same ideas in the pamphlets. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a wonderful game at trying to figure out what is influencing them at what time, because they never really say it. In fact, they resist it. They resist being theorized. They resist uh, talking about their work in any kind of edified way. You know, they just want you to look. Uh, and yet, when you start thinking about the writings and what they're saying in the writings, there's a lot there. There's really a lot there. Choice, I still think, was part of a generation. Uh, and what they were all children in the war, as I say in the book. Uh, and they had gone through a tremendous hardship in the 40s and 50s in Great Britain. And so this kind of infatuation with choice was now about having things, was now about uh, being able to engage a consumer society in a way that was simply fun, right? This was also the era of Mary Quant and of Carnaby Street uh, and of new fashion and of televisions and telephones and this kind of world exploding with new, new ways of communicating and new ways of making. Uh, they were thrilled by the promise of plastics because it was malleable and it was organic. Uh, without ever thinking about what was going to happen when plastic didn't, uh, never died. <laughs> so, so you know, their, their infatuations, I tend to, and I don't, you know, excuse them um, entirely, they, but they were very, very young. They were in their, in their like, mid-20s, and the world was exploding all around them, and this proved to be a very, very fertile field of ideation for trying to reinvigorate architecture which they thought had died, right? You know, people were still doing the same kind of Corbusian housing projects that they had been for 30 years. And that was the kind of gist of their protest. They were trying to really overturn all of that. I know that doesn't totally answer your question. <laughs> no, the only thing, well, I, I think Fernando wants to say, I was just going to say that um, just the second part, I'm curious about sort of where you think these sort of, like with the kind of miniaturization, like you say the iPhone, yeah. the sort of, um, where these technologies have landed, I guess, in architecture. Maybe that's too big of a question. Well, I mean, they've landed in culture, right? And David Green bemoans that. Mm -hmm. And I asked him in that interview, doesn't that really just become an iPhone? Yeah. He said, yes, it's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I also think in many ways they're not, they're not really controlling that. They're just reading. They're just reading culture. Mm -hmm. They're just reading in the way that culture and technology are developing. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're, they're sort of in touch enough uh, uh, with all of these things that are happening 
that they're not really driving that. They're just hypothesizing uh, what's happening and positioning a creative response with that in mind. May I add one question? Because I know, of course, you're, from what I understood, you're very interested in like expanding this analysis and uh, you know investigating the notion of environment. And I'm very curious about the kind of conversations you had with them today about the notion of environment, which was so central to their you know concepts and provocations uh, in the past. Uh, I would say that not environment in the way that it, the environment was emerging in ecological societies. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the environment they were looking at was cultural and was also, uh, uh, they were really involved in systems thinking. And, and we forget that, you know, they were co collaborating with Gordon Pasks, and so they were really interested in cybernetics. Yeah. Uh, and in one, there was one um, house that they built, a visionary house that they built in the middle of Herod's, uh, where it was supposed to be computer controlled. Right, and in fact, you know, they, they couldn't they couldn't do it with with what they had available technologically. So they built this massive number of gears underneath the floor, and then they had someone in the back driving these like, little machines around. Uh, and uh, supposedly, it was on a randomizer, so that if no one was there to control it, then something would happen, and they would start to do things uh, on their own. But I think this notion really goes back to what Daniela was saying about control. Yeah. That their idea of environment is one that you can fully control and master. I, I'm not. I'm not sure because I think you know a lot of it. I, I certainly think, and Cedric, Cedric Price, we should bring into this conversation as well, right? You know, because uh, he wrote explicitly about indeterminacy and about uh, uh, a, a number of um, uh, information ideas about information that were totally out of control. Right, and were, uh, uh, as I was describing control and choice, I think I was reading a lot of what Cedric Price was writing about at that moment, which is not about control, it's about being, being out of control. So it is very much about being mathematically indeterminate. Not even like behaviorally indeterminate, but mathematically indeterminate. Interesting. Yeah, I just... Just quick, but um, it's actually, I mean, the whole iPhone notion is really so true and so disturbing in many ways, um, because also it appears to me, if the technology is successful, it reverts back to some kind of universalism, which was really the point they were beginning trying to outrun, right? And to me, that, there's also the relationship between high tech. It's actually interesting when you look at high tech. I mean, my, my gut feeling would be to align high tech 80s architecture more with a very orthodox modernist ideology. I mean, that's where, where I would naturally sort of come from or think about in regard to um, n not really uh, change or things that can be adopted and plugged in and those kinds of issues, but, but more that technology in and of itself is sort of being privileged yeah. and becoming an ideology in and of itself. And if that's not a universalist approach, then I don't know what is. And that goes very much along the lines of things like iPhones, etc. So there's like, I don't know, perhaps the failure of some quote unquote in quotation mark. The failure of um, archigram is is precisely what keeps the work relevant to a certain degree and fresh because may, perhaps that's one way of resistance, one could think. Um, and there I think, I mean, just looking at the two parts, I mean, you started with these two kind of mirror images. Um, and I do think personally that the Santa Pompidou is, is, is my favorite high tech project. The Pompidou is my personal favorite of, of those. I think there's, there's just something there that I think later begins to streamline itself more and more into a different direction. But um, I don't know, the success of the story of high tech architecture worldwide versus quote unquote the failure, um, perhaps that has something to do also with the notion of universalism. Right, and how to escape it, or if perhaps it's inescapable when, technologically speaking, um, yeah, something becomes uh, the dominant way of thinking and seeing the world, right? And when it matches an ideology. I mean, I don't, I don't also, I don't, 
Uh, I think, you know, when we talk about the high-tech architects, it's not simply a kind of corporate architecture. I know they do work for corporations, but in terms of the trajectory of how they do their technology, I think we can, to be fair, that they, they do a lot of craft also. They do a lot of craft. And they do a lot of one-on-one -on -one systems that they develop for partic particular buildings, which are far over and above what an SOM or an HOK or all of the kind of American corporations and the kinds of reams of infinite storefronts that they put out, uh, it, it's, it's different, right? It's a different. When you see a high-tech building, it is different, you know, without a doubt. I would say less so for the, the kind of uh, bread and butter things that Norman Foster puts out, which are, you know, go forever and all look the same. Um, uh, and he's by far the most... Um, I don't know. I, you know, people that I interviewed with says that he now defines uh, the material development industries uh, in Great Britain because he has so many buildings that are in production all the time. Versus someone like Richard Rogers, who develops a new system every single time, whose uh, salary is weighted toward the least of his employees, uh, who gives all of his employees uh, little meal tickets so that they can go and eat in his wife's five-star restaurant next door. <laughs> uh, and his entire office rides bicycles around, even the guy in the red suit. Yes. <laughs> so I don't, you know, these people are not monolithic at all. You know, they're, they're all sort of different. They all have different takes on what they do. Uh, yes, are they supported by a, a kind of neoliberal expansion of the economies all over the world? Oh, yes. Yes. Not, not only that, but also an yeah. urbanism yeah. that really excludes. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I have to agree. Yeah. I think we have time for one or two questions from the audience before we move to the reception phase of the night. Any questions? Well, I have to say I'm delighted that this book exists. I'm excited to read it. And, um, you know, always, you know, inspired by um, Arca Graham. I'm curious, does the book go into others that were inspired by Arca Graham that delved into the ephemeral and stuff? And I, I, I have a, a mentor in mind that I know was influenced by them. His name was Friedrich St. Florian. Um, I'm wondering if there are others, and do you talk about those people having been influenced by this wonderful work? Um, believe it or not, I had to stop myself at some point before, I became, before the construction of networks became crazy. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I tried, um, I, you know, my interest in this was also talking about the effect on the city, um, and I became very... Um, you know, the way that uh, all of the, especially high-tech architects, operated in London was almost entirely exclusive until very recently. They built all of the buildings. Uh, and that's kind of hyper-local in a way, even though these architects are all, were already, you know, very internationally prominent. Uh, and yet you had this sort of weirdness uh, that they were building major parts of London. I think Norman Foster has built something like 70 buildings in London. There are enclaves, which are entirely high-tech uh, building enclaves, which in itself is really weird. <laughs> <laughs> that a, a city with a kind of global prominence like this would only cater to its local architects. So, um, you know, I think I tried to keep the topic somewhere around there because I was really interested in the phenomena uh, and the effect, especially on the city. <laughs> Joseph? Hi, Annette. How are you? It's good to see you. I'm good, Joseph. Okay. Uh, that was my question. Um, <laughs> Sorry, having only read or received the book about 30 minutes ago, I haven't read it yet. So please excuse my ignorance of the material within its covers. But 
I know we've talked a lot about like ArcGAM and its trajectory and like how it's um, like transformed a uh, generation of artists in London. And I would think maybe it would be interesting to hear you uh, opine on its ArcGAM's position in the world that we've briefly touched on, like this post-war generation that was bucking up against a monolithic culture and then producing, right? And how, like, you know, it's like that was the 1960s, like the world was on fire, the space race was happening. And I think during we were asked, you call it science fiction, but I think it's still more science speculative of like its response to the world, like we were putting a capsule on a different planet that was circulating ours, like that's like the modular house that they were kind of like creating. At the same time, there was influence there. But like we live in this moment now too, that I think we are uh, moving in a, like an interesting place where we are like somewhat dispersed in a culture where we don't have a monolithic culture, but we kind of all react to different ways and the same, different things in the same type of way. And like what is, the, like what would be the purpose of like the archogram idea or the mythos or movement at this moment? Like where, where do we go from here um, as we start to think about like what, what is 30 or 40 years out? You know, like, you know, the, you know, we're talking about creating these technologies that are ubiquitous now. And it's like, okay, but they hit it beforehand. They were not understanding how it was going to be utilized in this monolithic culture. Like everybody have an iPhone is the example that was given, but you know, what is, you know, the, this, this new technological revolution that we're moving into, the uh, access of AI to the culture that we have now, like where, where do we go from here and what is the image, uh, what is the importance of the image uh, of humanity or the, built by us people who are drawing when other things are now producing that? Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so I will, I'm sorry, I was going to intervene and you have the air, the final say of the evening. Robert, you have a yeah, question just, also? Just a quick comment, if that's all right. Um, okay. Well, the question maybe. Um, I really, uh, I can't wait to read the book. It looks fantastic. I was very impressed by your presentation, Annette. Um, I was at the AA for about 10 years. I co-taught with David Green for the first year I taught there in first year. And I saw a number of uh, roundtable discussions with the Archigram crew, and um, one of the one that one of the ones that struck me the most was actually uh, a conversation that included Peter Cook and Claude Perron. Right. And you might probably know the story from Peter, but um, in that session, it was the first time they'd spoken in like 40 years, and. Um, they were crying and apologizing to each other for a moment when Claude Perron had come across uh, for a conference and had got booed off stage by all the London students um, because the London students thought that Claude Perron was a fascist um, uh, because of the work he and Paul Virilio were showing. Um, and I think I find that a little bit it gives a glimpse of, and you know, he was upset at Peter Cook because Peter Cook hadn't kind of done anything about it at the time, and it was a misunderstanding, and they made friends and hugged and forgave each other for that 40 years of silence. But what it did is it gave me a bit of insight into the political climate of the students in London at that time, too, you know? And I think, um, like, you talk about the critique of the modern, but I think it was also a critique you know, as you mentioned, choice. It, choice represented something that um, I think was really critical uh, as a differentiator there, more so than necessarily the modernism itself. It was also the, all the political movements that were kind of in that period of time. Um, so yeah, but looks awesome. And uh, um, the only other thing I think is hopefully you say something about Lloyds of London, because I agree with you that um, Bubur is probably the most um, kind of related, but I also think that's tightly related to the Fun Palace as well, obviously, of Cedric Price. But um, Lloyd's looks like some of the drawings you were showing from Peter Cook um, uh, of the car body projects too, yeah. 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 But thank you, fantastic book, can't yeah, wait to read I'm it. I'm obsessed by Lloyd's of London, yes, yes. <laughs> There's plenty on that in the book. Javier? Javier. Javier. Last one. Last one, yes. Um, thank you very much, Annette. 
Thanks a lot. I didn't have the chance to read your book. I just bought it, so I promise I will look at it. Um, but it was it was beautiful to hear you. Uh, it's beautiful to hear uh, someone who writes well. So I, I think this is very inspiring, not only for me, but I hope that also for the students. I think that we really need to teach our students to write and to read, but also to write. Also, Vanessa, thank you for your uh, review of the book. It was beautiful also as a text to hear. So thanks very, very much. Um, and then I, I would like to go to my question or my comment. Uh, we have been speaking about special, well, mostly I'm now focused not so much on, on Norman or Richard, but mostly on Peter, on what Peter does today. And I would like to know what is it that you think of his, I saw him one year ago in Venice presenting uh, uh, his collaboration at the Neon Pavilion uh, for Saudi Arabia. And I would like to know what is your uh, understanding of that evolution? Why do you think he's there? Or how do you read this all? I have more doubts than answers, but I would like to know what is your opinion or your understanding of how Peter Cook lands into uh, designing Neom. No. Mm. <laughs> well, Maybe it's a compli uh, complicated uh, you know, question. I, it's, it's a mystery. I think, you know, frankly, I think they were all um, seduced by this idea. Uh, he said at some point this summer, perhaps this wasn't such a good idea to be involved in this project. Well, the only criticism of his uh, showing is actually, it's actually too tall. That's what he's been saying, you know. It's absurdly tall. But other than that... Yeah. No, I think it's really disappointing. The honesty, I think, is really disappointing. Um, it's interesting because his buildings I find sort of whimsical and charming. You know, he's finally getting to design buildings and he has wonderful stories. And when he came and lectured, he made us all laugh hysterically uh, because of the way he described them. That was, there was a kind of consistency in what he's doing as an architect architect now because he hadn't built anything forever. Uh, and the buildings that he was doing all around the world, little schools, little institutions, uh, and then, of course, is the kind of magnificent city landscape drawings, which I, you know, I could look at forever. So when I saw that he was involved in the line project, it's really disappointing. I haven't talked to him about it. I don't know if I want to talk to him about it. I don't know if I want to touch it. It's just, you know, I don't know what it is with this project. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a perfect conversation that we can carry to the reception. The department is inviting everybody to the reception that will be at the architectural archives here at 34th Street, go a few steps down the stairs and under the uh, ground floor of the Fine Arts Library. And Annette, thank you so, so much for bringing this book to us. We know how hard it is to write. We know how hard it is to publish, to gather all those images, to do all this effort that takes years and years and years. And at the end, you might get a check of like $17 in the mail of royalties. Uh, thank you for producing all this knowledge, for writing all those provocations, and we will continue the conversation at the reception. Thank I, I you so much. I would also like to say that... <laughs> This, this is a really atypical crowd. I think if you look around, you know, there are many neighbors, there are many old friends. Uh, there are not only my children, but their friends. Um, and I would love for everyone to come down to the archives. There should be a big spread of food. Uh, there's, there's enough for everyone. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>